You know, worship is um, purposeful. And we have diminished it a little bit in thinking of it in terms of a song service and what we prefer or don't. But when we have the pictures of the heaven in Scripture, they almost always include worship around the Lord. And I have discovered in my own life that when I have a great need or I feel stress or pressure, the greatest relief comes when I worship the Lord. Not necessarily in a group, but if I will, if I can just get up by myself and outside, but, but to be with God's people and worship the Lord is a demonstration of victory and triumph and liberty and freedom. And I want to give you permission. You know, on a, on a typical weekend, we come here and we come from about 50 different denominational backgrounds. Baptist and Methodist and Church of Christ and Episcopalian and Presbyterian and Roman Catholic and Pentecostals and people that have never been to church before. So it's not like any one person is getting what they want. <laughs> and so in the midst of kind of that general annoyance, you can withdraw and miss the opportunity. Or you can say, I'll worship the Lord. And I would encourage you, irrespective of what happens up here, to come to this place ready to worship the Lord. Come a few minutes early, find your seat, so you avoid that rush and hurry and push and bustle and all that, you know what it means? If you're five minutes late here, you're going to have to fight for a spot. They're in my seat. Somebody sits in your chair and you lose the love of Jesus. You know, if you come just a little bit early, you can pray for those people around you and smugly think, I got my seat. <laughs> but be prepared to worship the Lord. Don't make somebody drag you into that. It'll change everything. All right, don't take that off my preaching time. That's free and postpaid. <laughs> for our offertory prayer this morning, I want to ask you to join me in a proclamation. Um, I love the, the, the theme of what Mac led us in about the name of Jesus. And I want to ask you, we did this at one of the sessions sometime in the last week or two, but declaring Jesus is Lord to the north and the south and the east and the west. The Bible says that the day, there's a day in front of us when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every living being, and that, include, that would include several things, in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. Now, as a part of the church in this unique season in the earth, we have the privilege as ambassadors for the kingdom of God to declare the lordship of Jesus. And I would encourage you to build that habit. Some of you got it on the back of your car, and you thought that was just a step into the bizarre world of... But you know, when you pull into work in the mornings, if you'll say, you know, Jesus is Lord in this place, just in your car. When you come into your neighborhood at the end of the day, Jesus is Lord here. When you step through your front door in this house, Jesus is Lord. Begin to use the, the authority that is invested in you, and God has given you authority to declare Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. And then after we do that, we're going to give thanks to the Lord like we're really happy about his attention. Okay? Some of you are nervous already. It's like, what is happening now? <laughs> Wants me to talk at church. And I grew up in church. We were, um, we went to a church where the minister wore robes and vestments. And there, it was a dignified place. And I'm, I, the Lord deserves our respect. Now, I'm not opposed to that. And I, I'm not even saying that my memories are fully informed. I was a child. But, you know, the things I remember about church were not pleasant. The seats were not comfortable. It was not a place where you had any permission to laugh. If you laughed at church, the long arm of George would find you. <laughs> right? Going to reach out and lay hands on somebody. I mean, it was just a little... 
you know, and there, there were some other rules, like you looked forward no matter what happened. If a bomb went off in the vestibule, you should not turn around and look, or George would find you, right? And you, you couldn't squirm. You needed to sit there like you were paying attention. And so I don't really have very many pleasant memories, and it, it, it certainly... It was not a place you anticipated. It was more library-like, where there were stern people that monitored you. And it, it shaped my imagination of the Lord, and I, I, I'm an advocate for respect and all of those things. In fact, we could probably use some of that in a lot of places these days. But from, it, it, it gave me a wrong imagination of God. And I don't want us to lose our respect for the Lord, but I want us to bring an authenticity to who we are. And there are times, I think, to bring our emotions or to bring our, our mind to church is not a bad thing. So I'm going to ask you to join me this morning for offertory. We're going to declare Jesus is Lord to the north, south, east, and west now. I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to, in, in three crosses, it's pretty simple. This room is kind of square with the world, and I'll give you the compass points, but if you're someplace else, I'm really giving you a minute to figure it out. <laughs> and if you're directionally challenged, get your phone out, ask Rabbi Google. He will help you. He'll do that, really. <laughs> Where is north? If you get north, you should be able to work it from there, okay? <laughs> but if you're with me in three crosses, behind me is north, which means that would be smart group <laughs> and you're on a roll so this would be Jeez. look at you yes. I'm impressed all right now if you're at home you'll have to put down your coffee your Danish your quiche your slider whatever <laughs> but let's just stand together you know the assignment Jesus is Lord to the four, we're going to turn physically. Whichever room you're in, I hope you've got it figured out. Okay? And then when we get done with that, we're going to give thanks to the Lord. Amen. All right, can you take one more assignment? This is like heavy stuff. All right, we get to the end of that. If there's empty seats in your row, if you're in three crosses, will you move to the middle? I know, you got your edge seats, you came here early but there's people that would like to join us so you can make a new friend a couple of seats down. Now you've lost the joy of the Lord again. <laughs> All right. Jesus is Lord this direction, right? Don't leave when I turn my back on you. Okay. On three. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. And to the south. Jesus is Lord, and to the east, Jesus is Lord, and to the west, Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. There is none like you, and there's none your equal. We praise you today that through the blood of Jesus, we have been delivered out of the hand of the enemy that his power over us is broken, his authority over us is broken, that we've been forgiven and cleansed and justified and sanctified. We bless your name today, that Jesus is Lord over all creation. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Before you're seated, find two or three people around you and say, I'm a fanatic too. And then you can have a seat. I was serious about those empty seats on the aisles. If there's really some in there, make a new friend, okay? If you didn't bathe this week, just stay where you are. Don't move, okay? <laughs> we want to know who you are. Uh, you should have received an outline when you came in. 
If you're watching from someplace else, you can download those same outlines from the websites or the apps. The scriptures will help. We're working through a series under the theme of spiritual warfare and the end times. The Bible is a presentation of spiritual conflict from the opening chapters of Genesis to the conclusion in the book of Revelation. But there are some unique attributes of spiritual warfare as we approach the end of the age. Uh, we get some specific instructions, much like the specific instructions that Jesus gave his disciples around that last visit to Jerusalem. And so we're given some very specific information. We've been really processing some of the fundamentals of that. I want to continue that in this session. The, the theme for this one is which side are you on? It's a very important question. It will determine your role in time and it will determine your role in eternity. And I, I, I don't know that all the information we've been given is helpful. I'm going to acknowledge, usually when I build a series like this, I'll kind of outline the, the separate sessions in general before we start, so I have at least some sense of direction. I know that's not always apparent, but in my imagination, it lives large. Um, from time to time, our daily Bible reading kind of interrupts that for me a little bit. It doesn't take me off theme, it just breaks my plan, which is annoying. And our, our, the Bible reading we're doing right now, we're working through the historical books, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and we're getting a lot of the history. And as I've been doing the reading, I, I usually try to stay just a day or two ahead of the, the, the larger crew. Uh, every time I would read it, it seemed to speak to this topic. So I changed my pattern a little. You wouldn't know that. It still fits under the theme. But it's really taken out of what you're about to read this week in your daily readings. Because I think it speaks to this notion of spiritual warfare in a very pragmatic way. Uh, I'd like to introduce it. Last weekend, I mentioned to you the a British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, whose legacy was one of appeasement. He felt like the best thing he could do was appease evil. So he negotiated month after month, year after year, um, more and more of Europe into the hands of Nazi Germany until finally it was intolerable and they selected another prime minister by the name, you've probably heard of him, Winston Churchill. Now, he had the responsibility of unraveling what Chamberlain had put together. And he led Britain to victory through World War II. Uh, remarkable character, kind of cantankerous, a bit grumpy. Um, wasn't particularly welcome until there was a crisis. And they recognized in him a strength. And he was invited into a position of leadership. I'll spare you an extended history lesson, but I will share with you a few of his quotes. Many of them you've probably heard. But most notably, I'm sure you've heard this quote, and it came from him. The only, he said it to the British people. His, his messages to the British people galvanized them and enabled them to survive what was necessary to win that war. But the most outstanding, perhaps, perhaps was the statement, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I pulled some of his lesser-known quotes because they made me smile. He said, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> Sounds about right. For a nation to try to tax itself into prosperity is like a man standing in a bucket and trying to lift himself by the handle. <laughs> if you don't understand that, when you go home today, get a bucket. <laughs> okay. He said to the nation, this is not the time for ease and comfort. It is time to dare and endure. Seems appropriate for us today. And I'll give you one more. He said, if we open a quarrel between past and present, we shall find we have lost the future. I don't respect those that are trying to divide us because of our past. I believe it is the, one of the poorest forms of leadership. And we need to be aware and awake. I would su suggest to you that it's time for us in the American church to make an attitude shift. We have been practicing appeasement for several decades. I say that as someone who's lived his life for the great, to a great extent in the church. We are world-class appeasers. And I would submit it's time to begin to become advocates for the truth. It's a bit more of an assertive posture. I believe without doubt for us to flourish and survive what is before us, we'll have to find a willingness to say no to ungodliness. It'll have to begin in our homes. We'll have to have the courage to do it around our tables. We have winked at, accommodated, encouraged, participated in, covered over, 
We've had all sorts of excuses and reasons, but we haven't had the courage to begin that at our kitchen tables. But we'll have to go beyond that. We'll have to do it in our churches, in our schools, in our places of business, wherever the Lord provides us with the opportunity. You see, the awkward truth is we've spent decades now accommodating evil. We've even developed a culture and a language of capitulation. You'll recognize it when you hear it. It flourishes around you if you aren't yourself a participant. You know, we say things like, well, we just don't talk about faith or politics. Hmm. We're to separate the church and the state. I've noticed that's a very one-sided assertion. The state has no intention of separating itself from the church. Well, they just want the church to stay out of their business. Or maybe we'll say, we don't want to offend unbelievers. We want to build bridges of understanding. Hmm. We don't want to be judgmental. There's very few things you're going to be accused of these days in the public square that seem to be more diminishing than to be accused of being judgy. Ooh. To the point that we don't say shoplifting is wrong while well, they loot our stores. Folks, we have lost our balance. Or perhaps you'll hear somebody say, well, aren't we, after all, all of us sinners saved by grace? What right do I have to stand up for right and wrong? Well, I would suggest that our cowardice combined with very little fear of God has resulted in a church that is both anemic and to a great extent feckless. So I have some questions today, and we're going to process them through Scripture. Do you believe our faith belongs in the public square? Should our, you don't have to answer. <laughs> I'm grateful that you're willing to. There'll be a test later. Do we believe our faith should affect how we do business? Or is the greatest profit we can get our hands on the goal? What about does our faith impact how we select leaders? And if so, how? Should we discuss our beliefs at work? Should churches engage in discussions regarding current events? I assure you that that set of questions, if you addressed them to the historic church, even the church in the book of Acts, they would have thought you had lost your balance. It seemed self-apparent to those previous generations. Well, as I said, our Bible reading these days is taking us through the historical books, and I want to go there with you to 1 Kings 18. There's a snapshot, I believe, a biblical presentation of spiritual warfare and current events. Because I believe what we're watching happen in our world is a result of what's happening in the heavens. Now, I understand in the church we'd rather have a seminar and talk about whether angels exist or demons exist or what principalities and powers are, and we would be happy to do an eight-week course and fill in the blanks and learn what some Greek and Hebrew verbs and some words and understand the culture of the first century or the 10th century B.C., and we would feel like we had accomplished something. And I'm an advocate for learning. I've spent a good deal of my life in academic settings trying to learn facts and information. But the point of facts and information is to help you make a spiritual impact with your life. And I don't believe we've been nearly as zealous for that because that's a little sloppier. It's a messier business. There is risk involved. And if you're having an academic debate, the only risk perhaps involved is you get the answer wrong. Maybe you get a bad score or you raise your hand and you say something and the other people think you're a little simple. But those aren't really great risks. That's a very protected environment. And if you think courage is filling in the blank on a Bible study, you need to read your Bible more carefully. So I want to spend a few minutes and invite you back with me into the narrative to watch what spiritual warfare looks like in the context of real life, to see if we could understand what that might imply for our generation. Because we're going to meet our heroes one day, and they're going to ask us questions about what we did, not about what we thought about what they did. Do you understand the difference? Okay. Well, the king is Ahab. The prophet is Elijah. We talked about this in a good deal of detail in a previous session, but Ahab in the Bible is the gold standard for wicked. The Bible says that. That's not my opinion. I mean, that's not exactly the language, but that's the message. That of all the kings of Israel, the nation of, the, the, the nation of Israel has been divided. There was a civil war. 
same geographic footprint, but now there's two nations, and the northern kingdom is called Israel, and the capital of Israel is Samaria, and the southern kingdom is called Judah, and the capital of Judah is Jerusalem. Ahab is king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And of all the kings of Israel, he's the most wicked. Wouldn't you love to make the book for that? And Elijah happens to be one of the people God tags with responding to Ahab. Now, it's worth noting, before we even look at the text, God gave people the assignment to respond to wickedness. You'll need to think about that a little bit. Well, in 1 Kings 18, in verse 1, Elijah had gone to the king and he said, because of your wickedness, it's not going to rain, which in, in plain language means the economy is going to be destroyed. The people are going to starve. Your wealth is going to evaporate. Poverty is coming to the nation because of your wickedness, and it won't rain again until I tell you it will. Well, there you go. Now, it was a great enough threat to the nation that Elijah had to go into hiding for three years. He had to hide in a ravine had to hide in the home of a widow. So I wonder if we're willing to serve the Lord when there are consequences. Or if we imagine that the consequences for serving the Lord is enduring a long sermon. I mean, I know you have to do that, and I appreciate your great courage and boldness. It says, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Elijah goes in search of the king. He has a message for him again. So I just want to point out, Elijah is not merely a private intercessor. He doesn't just spend his time in the prayer closet, and I'm not opposed to that. Nor is he simply a student of Scripture. Nor is he just gathering his disciples together to discuss the character of God, all appropriate things. But you cannot understand his assignment in those contexts alone. And I, I'm going to continue to suggest to you that what's been presented to us as expressions of our faith is incomplete. There's a different response that is anticipated in Scripture from a person of faith. And if I had to summarize it in a word, I would choose engaged. There's someone who is engaged in the world in which they live. Jesus was. The Apostle Paul was, King David was, Moses was, Elijah is going to be, as we will see in a moment. The church throughout the book of Acts was. This notion that we can huddle in our buildings and can convene our classes and do our polite little projects and not engage the world in which we live did not come from the Lord. Now let's push on. We're going to look at a response of some people of faith and courage. Same chapter. The next verse is, Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. No kidding, if it hadn't rained for three years and you're an agricultural society, you got a problem. You have a real problem. Ahab had summoned Obadiah. Obadiah works for the king. He's the palace administrator. And then in parenthesis, the author of Kings gives us a little biographical information about Obadiah. He says, Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel, the queen, was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Now, there's no emotion given around that. There's no response suggested to the reader. But I want, to, I want us to imagine we're in that circumstance. He works in the palace. He's the palace administrator. The order of the king being enforced by the queen is to kill any prophet of God. Anybody that will speak on God's behalf should be murdered. And Obadiah hears that. He takes a hundred people that he knows that fit that description, and he hides them and provides food and water. Does courage sound right? Boldness? He's put everything on the line. What do you think happens to Obadiah if one out of a hundred people leaks that message? One sloppy sentence, one hint makes it back to the king. His life won't last out the day. 
Now let's not stop there. Same chapter, verse 7, as Obadiah is walking along, the king sends him to look for Elijah. Elijah met him, and Obadiah recognized him. He bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord Elijah? Yes. Go tell your master Elijah is here. And Obadiah says, What have I done wrong? <laughs> that you're handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death. <laughs> Why would you set me up like that? As surely as the Lord your God lives, there's not a nation or a kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or a kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear that they couldn't find you. I wanted you to see the intensity with which Ahab's been searching for Elijah. Being willing to confront evil meant a total disruption of his life, a total realignment of his plans, of his purposes, of his calendar. You processing that? I think most of us imagine we would like to do significant things in the kingdom of God, but we would like God to fit it into the open spaces we present. We don't want him to intrude on the things that we have planned. In fact, we talk about our lives in terms of our plans and my schedule and my dreams, and we get most annoyed with God if he ever has the audacity to intrude on our schedule or our dreams. Or if he disrupts our timeline. After all, I had planned by this point in my life, and then you can fill in the blanks. And I, I simply want us to acknowledge that the plain presentation in the text is that God said, Elijah, I'm going to need a three-year block of your time. And I'm not going to put you at the Waldorf. You've you got to go hang out in a ravine. I'll send some birds to feed you. I bet he didn't even have good Wi-Fi coverage. <laughs> Can you imagine? So now Obadiah is saying, you know, he's been looking for you everywhere. He's left no stone unturned in the surrounding nations. And now you want to put me in the, in the middle of this? Verse 11, but now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he'll kill me. He's not confused. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in caves, supplied them with food and water, and now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here, he'll kill me. I mean, he's serious. Do you hear it in him? I mean, he's like, what are you talking about? And Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. Now, you can read it. You can understand. But Obadiah serving in the palace and standing for the Lord's people. I want you to hear that. Because sometimes I think we imagine that the only way we can honor the Lord is to withdraw from those places. And he is serving the most wicked king in Israel's history. But he's doing the right thing. He's got everything on the line. He hasn't capitulated. He's not saying, I'm just going to stay close to the king because somebody's got to be here. He is serving the Lord in the midst of that wickedness. That's a hard job. Could we agree? There would be things you would see and be exposed to on a daily basis that would be emotionally and spiritually stressful. And Obadiah, even when standing for the Lord... It's very clear that he is living with the tension of evil close at hand. He understands that he faces death for any misstep, and yet he stays there. Wow! Wow! Elijah and Obadiah have very different assignments, but both are important, and each requires courage. When we talk about spiritual warfare and what it means to stand up for the truth, understand it's not one size fits all. But each one will take courage. Each one will take discernment. Each one will take some boldness. We've been far too guilty. I, I think social media has exacerbated this to an unhealthy degree. You know, we desire to live other people's lives. Stop it. God created us uniquely. We're everyone different. We have different gifts and different talents and different abilities. 
It is, it is an idea that does not come from God, that we should all be the same and have the same thing and do the same thing and be the same way. Stop competing with your neighbors. I've suggested it before, but I'll give it to you again. If you've been doing that, you know, if you're in competition, who's got the biggest TV? Who's got the biggest deck on the lawnmower? Who's taken the best vacations? Whose kids have had the most or done the most or been the most or seen the most? Here's my suggestion. Go stand in your driveway today, just like we did to the four corners of the compass a few moments ago, and, and to take your neighborhood and, and declare the people to the north the winner. I surrender. You vacation more prodigiously than I do. Then face the south. You have the biggest TV. I surrender. Face the east. Your kids are amazing. God bless them. Withdraw from the competition. It will help. And we bring a little bit of that into our service of the Lord. We see somebody, I want to do that. I want to be them. God's given us everyone a place to stand. In my experience, is it will take everything you have to stand in the place God has called you to. Verse 16, Obadiah takes the instruction. Obadiah went to Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Elijah said, I haven't made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's, Jezebel's table. I think it's worth noting that Ahab, when he sees Elijah, accuses Elijah. And my observation is that evil typically accuses those who oppose them. And they accuse the righteous of being divisive. Ahab refuses to acknowledge his sin and the impact of his leadership. He simply will not do it. The problem can't be him. It can't be his choices. Now, it's important to remember this entire story is taking place under the umbrella of the covenant people of God. This isn't like God's people and the pagans. These are all people who understand the covenant. They know their heritage. They know the story. They know about the, the plagues in Egypt. They know about the Exodus. They know about the parting of the Red Sea. They know about the manna in the wilderness and the water from the rock. And they know about Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments. And they know the stories of Joshua and Jericho. This is their heritage. So all of this is happening with a willful determination to make a change, to say the traditions that have bound us are no longer sufficient to give us what we want. We're going to behave in a new way. We're more enlightened. We're more aware. We're more awake. We're better informed. We don't need to be bound by the traditions that have bound us. Gee, that doesn't sound familiar. Spiritual warfare is not a new thing. It's not a 21st century thing. Neither is it out of date in the 21st century. The same forces, the same authority that were driving it in Israel are driving it in our world today. Ahab refuses to acknowledge his sin or the impact of his leadership. Ahab has opened the doors for evil, sponsoring those who encourage the people to do wrong. That's a very important point. He's the one that established, we looked at it in a previous session, he established the worship of Baal. He built the temple. He put up the Asherah pole. He put those people in place. He made it possible to multiply the wickedness of the people. He provided people to lead them in the wrong direction. Again, it's something we're familiar with. We're witnessing it. We would be wrong to think of that as an Old Testament concept. I gave you one verse just for the sake of time. It's actually a principle in Scripture. Romans chapter 1. That would be the New Testament for those of you who are keeping score. It's describing the downward progression of human character. And very near the completion of that downward progression is this verse. It says, although they know God's righteous decree, and I assure you, Ahab knew God's righteous decrees, as do many of the people leading us. 
The definition, biblical definition of marriage is not very well hidden. It's been a part of Western civilization for hundreds of years. To have the audacity to redefine that is not an accident. It is a willful setting aside of God's righteous decrees. But we want to. Duly noted, but it doesn't change the definition of it in God's sight. Romans 1, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Ahab was guilty not only of choosing the wrong thing, marrying a foreign wife. There's something already in the history of the kings about that. Think of Solomon. But he wanted to open the door more broadly to provide leadership to take the people further and further away from God. And Elijah and Obadiah and some others we'll meet in a moment have stepped into that breach at significant cost to themselves. 1 Kings 18. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Elijah went before the people and said... How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. You got to love his directness. Look, decide what you're going to do. Worship God or don't. The next sentence is uncomfortable. The people said nothing. For the record, these are the same options available to us. We're either going to serve God or we're not. There's no third rail. This middle ground thing is a fabrication. It doesn't exist any longer. We're either going to honor God with our lives or we're going to honor evil. You can't negotiate with evil. It doesn't work. Same options available to us. Notably in this story, the people were silent. They had no answer. What's the implication of that? It's the same one for us when we're silent. Don't be confused. To do nothing is to make a choice. To do nothing is to make a choice. To remain silent is to align with evil. You see, the event could, could have concluded at this point. It would have been done. This is this famous confrontation on Mount Carmel. Fire comes from heaven. You know the story, most of you. But that wasn't really necessary. If the people at this point had simply fallen on their knees and said, we are sorry. We know right and wrong, and we've chosen wrong. But they didn't do that. They're going to play this all the way out. We've been a lot like that. We don't really have to change an election will fix it for us. Economy hadn't been too bad. There's a lot of cash flowing around. It's going to be pretty good. Let's just not talk about that. We don't want to get involved with that. Let's do a Bible study. We've remained silent. We've stood there acting as if it's not us. It is us, folks. This is our watch. We're the church. We're the salt and the light. So if we're stumbling in the dark, the light's too dim. Now, you know this story. Because of the silence of the people, the only way forward is for Elijah to make himself more vulnerable. Please don't miss that. The people stay silent, so Elijah says, all right, showdown. We're going to build altars, and the real God will send fire. We won't start the fire. God will send it. You know the drama. He lets the prophets of Baal go first. And when nothing happens, it's his turn. You don't think they're stressing that? Oh, he was a man of faith. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So were you. It's stressful to stand up for the right thing. Occasionally I meet people so dishonest. They say, well, it's not hard for me to stand. It is for me. I would rather be liked than reviled. I'd rather be cheered than criticized. I'd rather be included than excluded. I would. I'd rather eat dessert than vegetables. I would. I would rather start with Oreos and chase them with hot fudge cake. And just to be healthy, I'll chase it with some fruit. <laughs> but I choose to eat vegetables. And I choose when I am aware to stand for the truth. And the consequences we will trust the Lord for. 
It's a very important narrative. Elijah has to make himself more vulnerable. Now, in chapter 21, the narrative begins to change. The focus is on Ahab's choices. We've seen Elijah's choices. In verse 20, it says, Ahab said to Elijah, you have found me, my enemy. This is after the victory on Mount Carmel and a lot of drama. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's a very important, you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He said, I'm, God says, I'm going to bring disaster on you. And then Elijah uses some rather graphic languages. Dog will, dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. If you'll allow me, I think there's a principle here that's relevant for us. God's people. And you have to imagine Ahab in that context. I'll show you in a minute. Included with God's people. God's people typically sell ourselves to evil. And this is what I mean. We imagine to, that, that there's something to be gained by cooperating with evil. So we cooperate. We fail to trust God. We willingly put ourselves under the authority of another spirit because we think there's something to be gained. It's what Ahab did. He thought there was advantage for him. So he sold himself to do evil. See, I would make a distinction. People who have never known God, people who haven't been a part of the people of God, they're simply choosing power and authority that they're familiar with. They've worshipped demons. They know they're real. They've seen the outcome. I've been in those places. I've been in those places where people worship demons and have witch doctors. And they understand the authority of the spiritual world in a way that those of us that are more educated struggle with. But the biblical presentation, and it, we need to note it, is that God's people sell themselves to do evil. It's a bargain. There's something we want. So we conveniently push aside what we know of the Lord. Same chapter. Back to the next verse. This is Ahab's response to what Elijah has said to him. It's one of the most stunning passages in all of Scripture to me. It says, there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Again, he's the gold standard. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before the Lord. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Are you kidding? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day. I'll bring it on his house in the days of his son. Now, we find that line in some other places in Scripture, usually attached to godly kings and judgment, and they've, they've sought to do an intervention or to, to lead a renewal. And God said, you know, there's, I will spare your generation, but your children are going to have to make a decision for themselves. And now he's using it in the context of Ahab. Ahab has repented publicly. Not some little private session with the chaplain. He's changed his wardrobe. He's put on the visible sign of humility. And he's walking around meekly, this haughty, arrogant, murderous, vile, and those are all biblical words. He's walking around meekly. Ahab humbled himself. This is a snapshot of the power of humility. The most wicked of the wicked. He chose this. He chose to humble himself. And please don't miss God's enthusiasm regarding Ahab's attitude change. He says, Elijah, have you seen him? The clown has repented. Living Bible. <laughs> now, this is important for us because we've been haughty and arrogant and prideful. And on our watch, wickedness has exploded. 
The power of repentance should not be overlooked. Look at Micah 7. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You don't stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. Did you know that, that God delights in showing mercy? But God is just. He doesn't show mercy just arbitrarily. He directs his mercy to those who have a change of heart. Isaiah 55 says, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Again, this is the prophet talking to the people of God. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Some of you will remember with me when Jesus was presented to the streets of Jerusalem and they had a choice between Jesus or Barabbas, the insurrectionist, Israel chose Barabbas. Well, I would submit to you from the vantage point that I hold that we have chosen a long line of treacherous people to lead us. Well, they've carried labels and pointed to their faith, but they haven't led with it very often. They have failed to honor God, and we have sold ourselves to do evil because we imagined there was something to be gained. We imagine if we sold ourselves a little bit to do evil and we kind of pushed our faith aside that perhaps we could be included among the powerful, the elite, the insiders. Or perhaps we thought there was a greater opportunity for us in the moment if we chose the wrong. We knew right, but if for in this instance we choose wrong, we can gain an advantage or get something we want. Or perhaps we recognized a threat if we stood for what was right. So we sold ourselves to do evil, to avoid the threat. After all, we want to be responsible to our family or our children or to whatever. We've justified our choices by citing our responsibilities, and we sold ourselves. Or maybe we were simply apathetic. God's choices were just not that important to us, and we sold ourselves. Maybe we were deceived but we sold ourselves. It feels to me when I read these narratives that is uncomfortably similar to the world we live in. And rather than imagine we're powerless, I want to invite you to say a prayer of repentance with me. I'm not done. It's not our final prayer, so hang on. <laughs> I'm almost done. But if you're conscious, as, 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 if we've, as we've walked through this, or if you have the courage to say to the Spirit of God, if there's any place where I have sold myself to do evil, let me see it. I'm going to ask you to simply say a, a simple prayer of repentance with me. You don't even have to stand. If you want to pray with me, you can just repeat it after me. Remember God's attitude towards Ahab when he repented? I want God to point at me and go, have you seen my servant Alan? He humbled himself. Stop justifying it. Stop excusing it. Stop tell me, telling me about the good you're going to do. When you turn back away from evil, it doesn't very often work that way. Because there's nothing we achieve or accumulate or accomplish that God needs. Everything's his already. What he most desires from us is faithfulness and integrity. Would you like to say a, a quick prayer of repentance? Let's just bow our heads. You can repeat it after me if you would like. All right. Almighty God, I thank you for your great love for me, that you have called me out of the darkness and welcomed me into the kingdom of your Son. And I come now in humility to acknowledge my sin. I have chosen against you. I sold myself because there was something I desired. Something I desired more than you. I wasn't confused. I wasn't deceived. I chose wrongly. And I ask you to forgive me. And today I choose you. I choose to establish Jesus as Lord of my life. Lord of all that I am, Lord of all that I have, 
Lord of all that I'll ever be. I thank you that he is my Lord. And I belong to him. He establishes the priorities of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to add one more component to this because I believe it's equally important. And it has to do with choosing the Lord for ourselves. We've met already the voice of Elijah and the courage of Obadiah. And some of you will know, you know the, the 7,000 other overcomers that are a part of this narrative. When Elijah complains he's the only one left, God said, oh, bother, there's 7,000 more. So I want you to be aware of Elijah and the role he held and Obadiah and the role he held, but there's 7,000 more overcoming in their own places as well. 1 Kings 19, this is Elijah, he's worn down. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and they've torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. All of that's true. That's a difficult season to have to live through. You suppose he thought it was the end of the world? I bet it felt like it to him. They're killing off the, the men and women of faith that he knows. They're tearing down the public places to worship God. In the land of Israel, in the covenant people of God, there's not like plan B, there's not somewhere to go to. He's not a globalist. These are the covenant people of God. They know you're unique. And he said, the leadership we have is shutting down the connection we have to Almighty God. I promise you, it felt like the end of the world. Up to this point, he's telling the truth. The next sentence is a little more self-directed. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And then he put his passy in and he sat down for a moment. <laughs> we all have those moments, every one of us. And this is God's response. He said, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Now we can read that narrative and we can think about Elijah and fire from heaven and all the drama or even Obadiah and his courage and the 7,000 overcomers. But it's easy for you and me to go, well, I'm not a prophet. God didn't call me to that. You know, I'm a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker, and I'm not even sure prophets exist. You know, we just kind of distance ourselves. But I would submit to you that we each one receive the Spirit of God into our lives when we become Christ followers. Every one of us. In a way that Elijah didn't have available to him. He didn't experience the new birth. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, again, New Testament, if you prefer, to each one, to each one, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Spirit of God is put in our lives for the good of the community, not for the pursuit of selfish ambition. And then it lists some expressions of the Spirit of God in our life. Every one of these manifestations of the Spirit is a manifestation of the Spirit, not something unique apart from Him. If you've received the Spirit of God when you were born again, and you do, then every one of these manifestations is in your portfolio. To one there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. What's the point of emphasis? The presence of the Spirit. To another faith by the Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy. Oh, that's awkward. Biblically, prophecy is not primarily foretelling, future predicting. Which team to bet on? Which lottery ticket to buy? That's not the primary role of biblical prophecy. Prophecy is the, is the, the delivery of God's perspective on current events. Isn't that what Elijah is doing? He's saying, this is what God thinks about what's happening. And it says, every one of us as Christ followers have the Spirit of God to give us a window of God's perspective into the world in which we live. Every believer re receives the Holy Spirit at conversion. We're all equipped to serve in the fullness of the Spirit. And I'm quite confident that often we imagine we should feel more godly or feel less frightened. But that doesn't line up with the narrative of Scripture. We serve the Lord in our brokenness, not our strength. 
That's our story. We stand for the Lord with quaking knees, not some false bravado. I don't trust people with that false bravado. If you've never been afraid, you haven't paid attention. The right thing is very seldom easy. It's just not easy. Who said it should be? Many of us have served together for years, some of us for many years. Together, we have learned to serve God and His people. We've done it in a variety of ways, from hoedowns to parades to classes to small groups. I mean, it's a lengthy list, but we have learned together to serve God and His people. And we've seen God honor that with many transformed lives, far more than we ever imagined, and certainly more than we're capable of in our wisdom or our ability. That's our story, agreed? agreed. Together, we've learned to give. That's another component of discipleship. Because we came to understand there really is no growth without sacrifice. It just doesn't happen. And we've experienced God's responses to us through many years. As we have given generously, God has responded in ways that ex with outcomes that exceeded anything we could have done individually. Does that seem right to you? It does to me. Well, I want to suggest that now we're learning to stand in some new ways. That together we'll experience God's faithfulness and we will grow in new ways. The same way we've learned to serve. It wasn't intuitive, it wasn't automatic, it wasn't fun. We typically grumbled our way through those first initiatives. We did. Do I have to? How long do I have to serve? Well, I don't want to serve with them. I didn't like the way the people were leading that I was serving with, so I don't know what I'm going to do. We grumbled our way when the invitations to give came. Well, do I have to give? Do I trust the people? Whose business is it? And I watched God change the hearts of hundreds and hundreds of people to learn to give with a freedom and a generosity, to trust the Lord that He's faithful. I hear your stories week after week. We're walking through it together again. And I believe with all of my heart, now the Lord has put us in a place where he said, I'm going to teach you to stand. And we kind of go, I don't really want to stand. I'd be happy for somebody else to stand. Since somebody else, I'm kind of busy. This isn't my season for standing. This is my season for doing something else. I had a plan. But together we will experience God's faithfulness. And we will grow again. Acts 5, I'll close here. These are our friends, Peter and John and the crew. Jesus is gone. You know the story. We've read it before. And now they're on the carpet. They're in front of the same people that ordered Jesus or orchestrated Jesus' execution. And they said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you've filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Remember what I said? Evil accuses the righteous. I think you are guilty of this man's blood. They're trying to act like they didn't do it. Gee, not much has changed under the sun. And Peter and the other apostles reply, we must obey God rather than human beings. We won't stop. Now, not everyone chooses to continue forward. That's an awkward reality of the story. There were 7,000 in Israel who didn't. There's a group in Jerusalem that are learning to stand, and there's a group in the earth today learning to stand. I want, I want you to be clear what's happening. There are many, many around us selling themselves for evil because they think there's an advantage. There's some perceived benefit. Maybe it's a threat they're seeking to avoid. But there are others learning to stand. I trust the Lord in you. We've been walking together for a while. And at every critical juncture, he has helped us. Then I believe we're at another one of those inflection points. So I brought you a prayer. It's what we do. We've repented. 
Now let's assert our determination to say yes to the Lord. Amen. 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 May it be said of our generation, God could trust us. God doesn't need a majority. The truth is powerful in and of itself. What he's looking for is men and women who will stand with his truth. I want to be one of those. And I believe you do too. Let's stand together. We can say this prayer. Have you found it? I don't want you to miss it. I wouldn't leave it to a one-time prayer at church. I'd take it with me. I'd put it in my phone. I'd start my day with it. Wherever you need to put it as a reminder. Old school, tape it to the mirror. Not the mirror on your car. <laughs> Together. Heavenly Father, you delight in showing mercy. Through your compassion and mercy, we have been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. Give us now understanding hearts that we might know you more fully. Give us boldness to stand for your truth. Give us discernment that we might see as you see. Deliver us from evil. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.